Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, episode 329, The Fall of Corregidor. Last time, we saw the southern islands fall rather quickly to the better supported and fully equipped Japanese soldiers. Thus, with Luzon and those islands conquered, it was time to take Corregidor and end this battle of the Philippines. During the landings of the Visayan Islands, General Homa was making his plans for Corregidor, as clearly the Allied troops there had no intention of surrendering. First off, General Homa kept it simple. His artillery units would line up on the southern shore of Bataan, especially on the heights of the Maravellas Mountains, and at Cacaban, about two miles from Corregidor, on Bataan's southeast coast, and they, all together, would target the island's anti-aircraft batteries, which were considerable. With that plank of the Allied defense done away with, Japanese bombers would then take over and work over the more inland defenses, hopefully with greater accuracy. All told, this would spell the end of Corregidor. And yet, that was only one phase of the HOMA plan. There was more work to do in regards to deciding which units would actually land on the island and attack the defenders in their tunnel hideout, and how they would safely get there, for no one on the Japanese command staff believed that every Allied gun could be taken out before then. The ironic part of this war for Corregidor was that the defenders only had enough food for another six to eight weeks. If Homa had decided to do nothing, he would have won in two months anyway. But Homa had waited long enough for victory, as had Tokyo, during the lull in between the first and second battles of Bataan. No, this would be brought to an end soon. And yet... Homa wanted to move on this next attack right after the April 9th surrender of General Edward P. King, but reality got in the way. First, the newly conquered territory of southern Bataan had to be brought under complete Japanese control, as there were still Allied resistors out there, hiding in the jungles. Next, Homa's men needed rest. They had been pushed as hard as the invaders themselves had pushed the defenders, and there were other obstacles to overcome, obstacles that could not be rushed by willpower alone. Homa had not had time to think about Corregidor until April 9th, but now that Luzon was all his, he turned his attention and staff to the problem. First, who specifically would land on the island and finish off the resistors? His decision was the 4th Division. They had the honor of bringing General Wainwright and his people low. The other decisions would fall into place, right? Not quite. In fact, Homa's plan, started on April 9th, would not be close to being finalized until the end of the month. Not that anyone, Japanese or Allied, could have guessed that during the second week of April. The staff of the 4th Division also got to work, much of the task falling on Colonel Yotohiko Yoshida, the division's chief of staff. But his task would be made easier by the addition of several units that would be loaned to the 4th, like the 7th Tank Regiment, additional artillery units from the 16th Division, along with other parts of the 16th. All were ordered to make for Cap Caben for training, such as landing operations, the fastest way to remove beach obstacles, and cliff climbing practice. Homa then told the reduced 16th Division to make ready for a feint at El Frile and Carabao Islands. While this was going on, the 22nd Air Brigade would be told to stand down for two weeks to repair their planes. Homo was not happy about this, but was somewhat pacified by having some planes continue to fly reconnaissance missions and bomb the island or nearby Allied vessels when the opportunity presented itself. To be sure, when the time came, Corregidor would receive a bombardment unlike anything it had suffered before. It was to be the mother of all pre-attack bombardments, and there was practically nothing the Allies could do about it. But then, reality reminded Homa, none too gently, that it was still nearby. First, the ships and barges needed to take the 4th Division to Corregidor were currently in Lingayen Gulf, 
about 110 miles or 177 kilometers to the north of southern Bataan. They needed to be stationed off Cap Caben on Bataan's southeast corner. Yet, in order to get there, they had to sail past Corregidor Island and enter Manila Bay. And Homa knew they would be blasted to smithereens by the guns on the island or be attacked by Wainwright's PT boats. That was why Corregidor had to fall in the first place. So what to do? Clearly the boats, which could not be taken overland, would have to sail at night, but their engines would give them away. This is where the Japanese Navy stepped in and tried an experiment, without telling Homa. The Army-Navy rivalry was still as strong as ever. Sending in two of its small boats, they were to sail through the North Channel, that is, between Corregidor and Maravelas, during the day. The two ships got to the city named after the mountain when the guns on Corregidor opened up. The two boats were badly damaged and barely managed to turn around for safety. But this alerted the American command of what the Japanese were up to. Homa was displeased, to say the least. But it was done and could not be undone. Now it was the Army's turn. They would sail about six boats through the same passage, but at night, and while air and artillery attacks were made on Corregidor, to cover the sounds of the vessel's engines. This was done on April 14th and was successful, so there was a way. Starting the next night, about 40 landing barges reached Manila Bay, as did armored boats, gunboats, and fishing boats taken from the locals. They reached Cavite, and engineers began the process of getting the boats ready for the 4th Division. But Homa had many more boats that needed to make the voyage, so each night a few more were sent. This process would not be completed until early May. And then the gods, or fate, or whatever else the attackers believed in, got a chuckle in when the 4th Division, Homa's tip of the spear, was struck by an outbreak of malaria. Before this outbreak, Homa already had just over 15,000 men in hospital. And when the 4th Division moved to the malaria-infested river valleys of southern Bataan, the majority of them became sick. Now, of the 30,600 patients in Homa's hospitals, a full 28,000 of them were there because of malaria. The general, desperate, sent a request to Tokyo for quinine, and 300,000 tablets were sent to him by air. Of course, they did not reach land until the end of April. Now Homa worried that his entire timetable would be thrown off, but he was determined to keep his attack date of May 5th. The invaders' main advantage, besides a preponderance of men and materiel, was their extensive knowledge of the defenses on Corregidor. This was obtained from numerous reconnaissance flights and information from POWs. As for the Malinta Tunnel, there the Japanese were more hazy in their knowledge. Still, if they could wipe out the anti-aircraft guns, then bomb the other guns on the surface, all that should be left were the three assumed lines of defense. The last and final line, the men of the 4th Division were told, would be supported by artillery and machine guns. Hence, the invaders had to move fast upon reaching this line, or many of the Hohei would be lost. This turned out to be an accurate description, more than a warning. Given the invaders' knowledge, it was decided that the 4th Division would be split into two forces that would land near either end of the island on the north shore, thus negating the enemy being able to focus on one threat at a time. These two landings would be more challenging to support, but the advantages of meeting up in the middle of the island, thus cutting off anyone from the Malinta Tunnel from getting out until they surrendered, was deemed worth it. On April 10th, Corregidor was targeted by artillery. Their goals were the seacoast batteries, the anti-aircraft guns, searchlights, any short-range cannons that could be found, and finally, beach obstacles. To be clear, the tonnage of shells lobbed at the island was reduced, for now, to conserve ammunition. Homa 
had a deadly surprise for the enemy. Likewise, the air rage over Corregidor would be scaled back, for now, but their targets were the same as the artillery. Besides these bombings, reconnaissance flights would be carried out to see how the Allies reacted to the attacks. Now, as neither participant in this contest expected anything other than a Japanese victory, the troops of the 4th Division were given specific instructions should one of the Americans approach them with a white flag. Basically, as Homa wanted this over, either General Wainwright himself or whoever was the commanding officer had to present themselves to the men of the 4th so that person could be taken to a superior commander. And that person, whoever it was at the time, was told, you can only accept a complete and unconditional surrender. Now that the attack was set, General Homa tried his own sleight of hand to hopefully lull the defenders into a false sense of security. The general made a big show of arriving in Manila on April 29th, the emperor's birthday, for celebrations. Then he told all who would listen he was heading to Mindanao to take over operations there. But then he and his staff secretly snuck back to Balaga, the headquarters of the 14th Army. This was located just above Orion on the east coast, near the home of the modern-day Bataan World War II Museum. Hope to see you there one day. Also, all other operations in southern Bataan that could not be done away from the eyes on Corregidor were to stand down. The Americans and Filipinos were not to be given a hint of what was to come. Still, the defenders knew something was coming, and the man in charge of the beach defenses was Colonel Samuel L. Howard, commander of the 4th Marine Regiment. He and his were ordered to Corregidor back in late December. When added to the Marines from Cavite, Howard had 66 officers and 1,365 enlisted men, six months of extremely reduced rations, and enough clothes for two years. Both amounts were more than enough for the battle that was coming. Colonel Howard used the currently defensive program that was in place on Corregidor. His first battalion was to protect the east sector, that is, from the eastern end to just west of the Malinta Tunnel, near the center of the island. Amazingly, there were few defensive positions here set up, so Howard got his Marines busy to start digging tank traps, trenches, tunnels, improving the fields of fire, and stringing up 21 miles of wire. The 3rd Battalion was to defend the middle sector, from the west end of the Malinta Tunnel to the middle section of the bulbous head of the tadpole-shaped island, which left the 2nd Battalion to guard the western end of Corregidor. Staying with Howard was the Headquarters and Service Company. And when Bataan fell, some of the troops there managed, at the last second, to make it to Corregidor. So by mid-April, Colonel Howard had about 4,000 men for his defenses, of which 1,352 were Marines, 905 naval personnel, and just over 900 men from the Philippine and U.S. Army. The rest had no training and were not expected to offer much help. Before the invasion came, the East Sector had 1,115 men, six searchlights, and ten 75mm guns. The Middle Sector, the same, along with three additional lights, one 155mm gun, and seven 75 pieces, and one 3-inch gun. Finally, the West Sector had 915 men, four 75s, and one naval gun. And when the battle was joined, there would be no time to shift men around, so each sector had to take care of itself. On April 9th, a 75mm gun battery opened up on Corregidor. Then Japanese bombers flew over to join in on the assault. This was the first major bombing since the end of March. Then, on April 12th, the guns stationed at Cavite got involved, and the intensity only went up from there. Soon the Allied seacoast guns on the North Shore were taken out. Then other guns further inland were silenced. Then the searchlights were targeted, 
The intensity of the shelling was only increased and never really stopped. But then came April 29th, the Emperor's birthday. Homa celebrated this by arranging the largest attack on that day so far. The bombers got things going at 7.30 a.m., but then the artillery took over. By day's end, smoke hung over the island. Its grass fields were aflame. Two ammunition dumps had been set off. Observation stations were leveled. The power plant running the seacoast searchlights was knocked out, and at least three guns that had been returning fire were destroyed. But to give a tangible example of the intensity of the Japanese attack, on May 2nd, 240 millimeter shells weighing 360 pounds or 160 kilograms of high explosives managed to get through to Battery Geary's magazine located close to the southern shore on the island's west end. The resulting explosion flung out the 10-ton barrels of the 12-inch mortars like they were toys. One section of the reinforced concrete slab, weighing about 6 tons, was thrown 1,000 yards, which cut through a tree that had a 4-foot diameter. Only then did it come to a stop. Then it got worse. Clearly, April 29th, Hirohito's birthday, was not the best that the enemy's guns could do. General Wainwright estimated that the enemy, between artillery and bombs dropped, delivered about 1.8 million pounds of shells. Even worse, the firing was becoming more focused, as the defenders' guns along the northern beach were wiped out. Surely the enemy was going to land there. On May 3rd, the last visit by an American submarine left Corregidor. It carried out 25 people from the island, a complete roster of all military personnel still alive, and the last bag of mail from the servicemen. The artillery and bombing campaign managed to reach an even higher pitch on May 4th, then was increased again the next day. Now it was to the point that the entire island shook from the blasts. The result being the searchlights, beach defense guns, landmines, and machine gun emplacements were all destroyed. Months of work was undone by May 5th. Indeed, that night, just before midnight, the shelling of Corregidor came to a stop. There could only be one reason for this. The invaders were coming. The 4th Division with numerous barges, at least 100, had left LeMay around 9 p.m. By 10.30 p.m., it was clear that they were heading for the eastern half of the island. Just after the guns stopped, enemy troops were reported to have landed near North Point. The battle for Corregidor had begun. The war for the Philippines had started six months ago, and this battle had been a solid month in the planning, and yet it was to suffer mistakes from the outset. The men from General Kitano's 4th Division were separated into two forces to land on consecutive nights on either side of Malinta Tunnel. Tonight, May 5th, Colonel Kempachi Sato was to lead the 61st Infantry Regiment, supported by tanks from the 7th Tank Regiment and artillery units, and land on the northern shore to the east. The following night, Major General Correo Tanaguchi was to land closer to the western end, near James Ravine, with the 37th Infantry Regiment, a battalion from the 8th, the rest of the tanks from the 7th Tank Regiment, and artillery units. As it was the stronger of the two forces, it was to serve as the hammer to Sato's anvil. But as the invaders expected a difficult battle, not only were the men trained hard just having gotten over malaria, but they carried extra rations, fuel, and ammunition for an entire week, along with extra water. And all this weight, combined with the still-recovering men, was about to spell doom for many of Sato's men. The plan, specifically, was for Sato to land with his men near Cavalry Point, which is above the western end of Kindly Airfield. They would establish a beachhead, and then, as some of them would drive due south to cover the rear of the other group, that group 
would head west, making for Malinta Tunnel. As the defenders would surely respond to this, when the other half of the 4th Division, led by Colonel Tanaguchi, landed on the north shore of the west end, near James Ravine the next night, it would hopefully be too much for the defenders. But as Sato's barges headed out, the Japanese responsible for controlling the smaller vessels did not compensate for the tide between Bataan and Corregidor. So Sato, in one barge with a part of the 1st Battalion, saw the barges of the 2nd Battalion get out of place. This would affect when and where they landed. Sato issued orders for the vessels to get themselves straightened out during the journey, but that never happened. The reason for Sato's vexation was that if they landed out of place, and indeed they would land about 1,000 yards further east than planned, they might get hit by their own artillery trying to offer cover fire. Also, they were trying to make for a location that had been thoroughly covered by previous artillery fire, thus making it relatively safe to land there. In the end, the naval craft with the barges that were to cover these landings had to choose whom to cover, as the barges would be landing in the wrong location, at the wrong time, and in the wrong order. Now, of course, the defenders knew none of this, not that it mattered. The enemy was approaching, and thus the men on the beach and in the hills opened fire. Unfortunately for the Japanese, the defenders had hidden a two-gun 75mm battery just east of North Point, which put them close to where the 1st Battalion was coming ashore. Further, a few 37mm guns had also been hidden for the last few weeks and thus had not been obliterated. So as the attackers came ashore, the large and smaller guns opened up, and some of them were only 300 yards away from their targets. When parts of the 2nd Battalion of the 61st Infantry Regiment started approaching shore just before midnight, the defenders opened up. Soon, all the guns that had spotted the threat opened fire as well, 12-inch mortars, 3-inch guns, and the 75mm beasts. Though the searchlights that helped these guns were quickly taken out, there was enough moonlight to still see the enemy. Back at headquarters at Cap Caben, those who were viewing this spectacle through binoculars were quickly horrified by watching whole swaths of men fall into the water, never to be seen again. Or worse, an entire barge was taken out, with no survivors. But now came the results of the overloading of the men, who had only recently recovered from malaria. For those that survived their barge overturning, they were pulled down by the weight of their kit, and did not have the strength to swim back to the surface. Enough of this was witnessed to spread the stories around and further shock the attackers, who thought this part of the last battle would be the easiest. Of the first wave that came in, at least half of the men were killed or drowned. For the second wave, the numbers were even worse. One officer estimated that only 800 men of the first 2,000 safely made it to shore. No more men were planned to land that night, which was fortunate for them. When Homo was told of the lost men and ships, he audibly groaned. Still, all was not lost, as the survivors of the 1st Battalion stuck to the plan. Heading south, they soon reached the southern shore at Monkey Point at 1 a.m., now May 6th. Thus, any defending troops to their east or on the eastern end of the island could no longer help headquarters. Also sticking to the plan, the rest of the battalion turned west and managed to take an area around Batter Denver, see cover map, between infantry and cavalry points, and their artillery and tanks were coming ashore. The price had been high, but phase one of the attack had been successfully carried out. General Homa had been wise not to land at the very end of the island and so have to fight his way to Malinta Tunnel. Yes, the defenders had about 13,000 men, but they were scattered all over, trying to protect all of the island. 
As things stood, the Japanese figured out that of their men that were now in charge of Battery Denver, only two platoons of defenders were between them and Mylene Tatano. Wainwright and his staff figured this out as well, thus released some of the men manning the large guns to create more infantry. As these men were from the guns to the west of Mylinta Tunnel, the western half of the island was now weaker in defenses. Now that the defenders had more men to the east of the tunnel, they went on the offensive. But Sato had his own reinforcements in the form of the 2nd Battalion. So from 2 to 4 a.m., intense fighting took place near Denver Battery. But the Japanese held their ground. Colonel Howard had already thrown in half of his reserve force. It made no difference. At 4.30 a.m., Howard committed the last of his reserves. It has to be said these men were mostly not in any of the armed service. Still, they were given guns and told to help push back the enemy. By 6 a.m., all was in place for the Allied counterattack, which actually caught the Japanese off guard. Hence, they were pushed back. Of course, that was only on their flanks, the center of the Japanese line held due to a heavy machine gun. This threat was answered by Lieutenant Bethel B. Otter, U.S. Navy, the commander of Company T, 4th Provisional Battalion. Taking grenades, Otter and five volunteers crawled close to the machine gun and threw their grenades. The machine gun crew was taken out, but soon other enemy troops rushed forward and killed Otter and four of his five men. Overall, Homa was not happy. Malinta Hill, under which was the tunnel, was to have been captured by sunrise. Clearly, that wasn't going to happen. Should the other landing scheduled for that night be canceled, a wait-and-see decision was taken. As for Colonel Sato and his men, they realized the boats that carried their extra ammunition had thrown the boxes over the side and taken off to get away from the defending guns. Sato was told his men would probably be out of bullets by 11 a.m. What Homa could not know, because communications were so bad, was that of the fighting near Denver Battery on the Allied left, Japanese right, Sato's men had finally set up their light artillery and was giving the defending line hell. Colonel Howard committed the very last of his reserves, a captain and 60 men, to help the fighting near Denver Battery. Due to their momentum and their numbers, the enemy was actually pushed back for about 300 yards. But then the fighting bogged down. A push to the sea was not going to happen. But then the tide turned, for the last time, in the attacker's favor. About 10 a.m., three tanks that Sato's men had managed to bring ashore entered the fray. The defending line was shot up, the survivors unsure how to proceed. As things stood, the American and Filipino troops on the line were trapped, sandwiched between tanks, machine guns, artillery, and planes overhead. Some 700 defenders had been killed, another 1,000 wounded, but no one could move to help them. On the west end of the island, only two companies, about 300 men, were still standing, but all their guns had been destroyed. If another enemy force should land to the west and Wainwright did not surrender, all on Corregidor would be slaughtered. General Wainwright knew that he could order the men to hold out for the rest of the day, and they might actually be able to do that. But when more invaders were landed, it would be over. Why waste all those lives? No, Wainwright sacrificed one more day of freedom to save several thousand lives. At 10 a.m., he decided to surrender, one hour before the Japanese ran out of bullets. General Baby, his chief of staff, was told to send a surrender message to General Homa. Also, all arms larger than 45 caliber were to be destroyed. At noon, the American flag would be lowered and burned, replaced with a white flag. The staff got to work, 
That's when General Wainwright sent the following message to President Roosevelt and General MacArthur. With broken heart and head bowed in sadness, but not in shame, I report that today I must arrange terms for the surrender of the fortified islands of Manila Bay. Please say to the nation that my troops and I have accomplished all that is humanly possible and that we have upheld the best traditions of the United States and its army. With profound regret and with continued pride in my gallant troops, I go to meet the Japanese commander. After signing the official document, surrendering all of the Philippines to the Japanese on May 7, 1942, Lieutenant General Jonathan Wainwright was taken to a radio station to broadcast the capitulation to American troops in the area so that there would be no doubt of the veracity of the surrender. Postscript. Corregidor was a hard-fought victory, but one wonders if anyone in Tokyo realized that their larger plan had not come to fruition, namely that the start of the war would force the Americans to take whatever navy they had left in the Pacific, bring them all together for a decisive showdown with the Japanese navy, per Alfred Thayer Mayon's principle of one mighty naval battle to decide everything. But that had not happened. No U.S. Navy had come out to fight. What now? Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So, finally, the Philippines is over. Um, not sure what's coming next. We'll, I've got a couple things uh, I'm working on. We'll see how it goes, but obviously I'll keep the storyline going. So, But, but we will wrap up the Philippines there, and then I'll, of course, at some point I'll do something about the Bataan Death March. But I'm going to take a break from that now and, and get back to the main action of the war. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment and say hi and welcome aboard to a couple of members and those that have donated. So as far as my latest members, where you, you pay $5 a month and you get two extra episodes, um, there's James Owens from Lawrence, South Carolina, my home state. Hey, James. And he donated. Thank you very much. Uh, Robert Thrift from Atlanta, Georgia. Michael Deem from Geelong West, Victoria, Australia. I hope I got that right. Geelong. Um, Anders Berkier, uh, West End, Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. If you get a chance, Anders, say hi to Cam for me, my partner in my other episodes, uh, other podcasts. Uh, Richard Gibbons from uh, Stockport, Cheshire, UK. I think that's near Manchester. Chester, sorry. Um, Rebecca Schilling from Zurich, Switzerland. Um, Robert Lofthouse, who I just interviewed. It's kind of strange. I've never had uh, someone I interviewed become a member, but thank you, Robert, very much for that. Kansas City, Kansas. Um, Dale Jenkins, New York, New York. Uh, and I think, la- oh, no, uh, Alan Hammer. And then Robert Lee from Lakeside Park, Kentucky. So those are my latest members. Thank you very much for supporting the show. Um, it really does go a long way here to uh, making everybody happy. So as far as those who have donated, there's Joel Hollis from Texas. He just sent me a nice email. So thank you, Joel. Rodney Aikeny. And yes, Rodney, I am working on episode 190, trying to get everything straight. 
I had fixed it before. I'm not sure what happened. Go away, cat. Uh, I'm not sure what happened, so it must somehow got messed up again. Uh, John Hawk, uh, Brent Abels, uh, George Salim Bean. I'm, I'm George. I'm sorry. I know I'm saying that wrong. Nick Oliver and Marta Sweeney. So thank you very much for making donations. And lastly, uh, Jason Ferris. Um, it will probably be months or a year before you hear this, but I just got your wonderful email about the uh, museum in Quantico, Virginia, the, the Marine Museum. I definitely need to get up there. I used to live in Fort Belvoir, Virginia when I was a little kid because my father was in the Air Force. But uh, I definitely need to check that out, and I'll let you know so we can meet up there and have lunch together and we can walk around. Um, and once that is set in stone, I'll, I'll probably make an announcement on the different medium platform, media platforms so anybody else can join too, depending on, of course, what COVID does. These are the times we live in. So again, thank you very much. We're finished with uh, the Philippines and we will move on from there. Take care, everyone.